I think the most important thing about Bitcoin that I keep saying to people um, is that you need to remember it was very, very political. Um, the, the problem that, that Nakamoto tried to solve was this e-cash, electronic cash problem. So you've got people that want to use ones and zeros and nothing else. Now, that problem was actually solved about 30 years ago by a cryptographer called David Chom. Um, Chom came up with a digital reserve that would sit in the middle of every transaction. It was a supercomputer and they would make sure that every time one person sent electronic cash to another person, they could only do it once. The problem is called double spend. The double spend means how do you stop identical ones and zeros being reused. It's a very, very hard problem. Chom solved it, but Chom did it with the central reserve, a digital reserve bank. Now Nakamoto is an anarchist and looked at that and said, I don't want a reserve bank, I don't want government, I don't want auditors. So it was political. Um, you need to remember that the problem that Nakamoto tried to solve, he wanted to solve it in a particular way. He wanted to solve it without any administrators. So you come up with this algorithm that basically crowdsources the monitoring of the, of the currency system. People seem to think that, that Bitcoin created decentralization, but it's actually the other way around. <clears throat> um, Nakamoto said, I want decentralized money. It has to be decentralized. I don't want a central admin. So it was actually a design assumption. You know, it's, it's like saying, um, the locomotives created um, the, the, the train network. Well, no, it was the other way around. We wanted to move things across the country, so we built the railway. And people interpret Bitcoin the wrong way around. So I think that's one thing to bear in mind, and that's, that's a fairly lengthy, detailed thing that I've just said. But there, there are several really much simpler things to, I think, explain the, the Bitcoin um, enthusiasm. Nakamoto was a mystery character, right? And so it's very sexy right from the start. You've got something that was um, technically ingenious, um, seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, it seemed to beat a lot of really clever people at their own game. And so people imagine that Nakamoto was a single, perhaps tragic character. Um, and that's, that's fantastic. I mean, we love that sort of story, right? Plus what he did was very, very, what he, she did was very, very clever. And, and so that earned a lot of respect. Um, Nakamoto was clearly an anarchist, anti-establishment. And I think anti-establishment is sexy. And um, the paper was incredibly well written. Um, so, you know, it was compelling. What really energised people was that Nakamoto solved an unsolvable problem. The idea of having electronic cash without an umpire was thought to be unsolvable. People have said it's never going to be done. So when you solve an unsolvable problem in technology, that, that creates amazing innovation and energy. It happened with the Wright Brothers flyer. So the very first powered aeroplane just amazed people. They thought it was magic. They didn't, you know, photography was the same. Um, photography in the 1850s was thought to be magic. It was incredible. And yet it was, a you know, an artificial machine. So um, the Wright Brothers flyer created incredible innovation. But if you look at what happened in five years after the flyer, most of those second generation aeroplanes were jokes. Um, you know, the inventors came out of everywhere trying to copy the flyer. And you see this with blockchain. People are running out of everywhere, copying the blockchain and really making a terrible mess of it um, most of the time. We've got to remember what, what Bill Gates said, right? People overestimate what can be done in one year and they underestimate what can be done in 10 years. And the underestimating is that you can't predict what will happen in 10 years' time. So I say to people, I mean, blockchain is, to be fair, nearly 10 years old. But I think it's got another 10 years to run before we really see what its long-term um, impact is. And at the moment, the futurists are trying to have a bet both ways. They want to get on something now and change the world now using the original prototype. And the prototype's not fit for purpose. You know, when, when you say Bitcoin works without trust, you've got two people, Alice and Bob, they, they don't know anything about each other. They don't want to know each other because they want to remain strangers online and they can move electronic money. And that is magic. Um, but it does not mean that they trust each other. So remember The Economist magazine? Uh, 12 months ago, The Economist had a special issue and the front cover was called The Trust Machine. 
And I just said, no, Bitcoin is the antitrust machine. It is, it is about achieving a very important outcome of moving real money without trusting anybody. Um, and you, you cannot jump from that to say, well, wow, we can create trust in new ways because we'll have transparency of government, we'll have consensus, we'll have electronic voting. And I'm afraid that that's fundamentally misguided because the blockchain was never designed to create trust. It's just not what it does. So it's a, it's a really um, weak jump to go from the, the weird world of crypto money all the way through to government because it's not what the blockchain does. The blockchain is so that you can move money without trusting people. It doesn't create trust. It, um, it allows people to do important things without trust, but only one thing, which is to move Bitcoin. In, in other areas of security and technology, we've talked about trust for a long time, technological trust, social trust. You know, do I trust you? I've never met you before, and you're going to take these words of mine and turn it into a, a thing? I don't know what you're going to do, but, you know, I know enough about you. Um, you seem like a nice guy. I've seen your work. I like your work. Um, I, you know, I trust that, that this is going to turn out okay. That is not what blockchain does. It's just not in that space. And, and people only think that it is in that space because we think very vaguely about digital. Um, we don't have really good intuitions about digital. And um, people use this word trust. They also use the word consensus. They misuse the word consensus. Um, in, in blockchain, consensus means that everybody has the same copy of the Bitcoin ledger and they have reached agreement that every single Bitcoin movement is accounted for. And, you know, it takes 10 minutes or 15 minutes to do that work. And it takes eight or 10,000 computers to reach consensus. But I'm afraid that sociologists and, you know, techno-social commentators and a whole lot of sort of self-taught amateurs have taken the word consensus and they've overloaded it. And they, they, they use the word as we do in social discourse. So they think that consensus means that you and I have agreed on um, what this movie is all about. And we've agreed that, um, you know, we've reached consensus that blockchain is really interesting and we've reached consensus that there's a story that needs to be told. Well, uh, no way does blockchain do any of that sort of thing. So again, when somebody says the blockchain could be used to reach political consensus, I'm afraid it's just nonsense. Um, it's just not what it does. Clearly, you can put anything on the blockchain you want. People say to me, just this morning, somebody said to me, thousands of people are doing things on the blockchain, Steve. Are you, are you blind? And I said, no. I know that you're putting things on the blockchain insofar as you're putting pieces of code into Bitcoin transactions and you're, you're agreeing that these things represent diamonds. The diamonds themselves are, of course, not on the blockchain. What's on the blockchain is somebody promising you that, that you know, this, this code represents a diamond. And that is the sort of thing that Nakamoto themselves said, don't do that on the blockchain. But it's in the paper. Nakamoto said in the paper, in the abstract of the Bitcoin paper, if you still need a third party to prevent double spend, then the, then the algorithm loses its benefits. It's a direct quote. So, you know, you can do this thing, but I wonder why you would bother having eight or 10,000 computers running around the world, soaking up a huge amount of the world's electricity, in order to reach consensus about something that, in fact, one person already knew. One person in the diamond mine or in the diamond broker dug up this three-carat stone and they knew that, in fact, it was a blood diamond, but they lied and said, no, this is a real diamond, and then they put that fact on the blockchain. You don't need eight or 10,000 computers to all agree on about the fact because the fact starts out to be wrong. So you can, you can put anything on the blockchain, but it's not just a regular database. If you want to just have a spreadsheet of, um, of land titles or identity tokens or, um, or diamonds or, or food, you know, some people are trying to put food on the blockchain um, for, for paddock to plate pedigree. That's great, but you're just treating it as a database because the reason it is what it is, is that you're trying to reach consensus about purely digital assets where you don't want to trust anybody. 
the R3 consortium that was founded by about 40 or 50 very big banks about 18 months ago. Now, that is fantastic work, and it's what we call a third-generation distributed ledger. So they were absolutely inspired by blockchain, just as um, the aviation industry was inspired by the Wright brothers. Um, what they did at R3 was that they raised a lot of money, and they sat back and they said, um, blockchain apparently allows people to do things without any trust at all, um, but we know in banking that we've got some trust and some regulation but we've got too much regulation in banking. And wouldn't it be more efficient if we could have 40 or 50 banks get together and agree about the state of a financial instrument and exchange a little bit of information, but not, not every piece of information? Wouldn't it be quicker and more streamlined? So they've, they've been inspired by the blockchain properties and they've basically rebuilt it from the ground up. Um, they've absolutely rebuilt it. So, you know, I compare, this is a bit of a stretch, but Blockchain to R3 is a bit like the Wright Brothers flyer to, say, um, the Space Shuttle. Um, the Space Shuttle is amazing, but it is a very, very specialised thing. Um, and you don't get in the Space Shuttle to fly from London to New York. Um, the R3 consortium, very, very smart people working in financial services, they saw some problems that they could solve using something like the blockchain. They rebuilt it from the ground up. They wrote a paper a few months ago that says, by the way, what we've built is not a blockchain. They were very careful to actually spell that out. So um, that's the way that science and technology and innovation works, right? You, you have an unsolvable problem, it gets solved. Um, a lot of people run around getting overly excited. A lot of other people say, hey, let's just be calm and um, considered about what problem we're trying to solve. So you come up with R3. And so, you know, look out for, um, look out for blockchain 4. Um, I, I say that the Bitcoin blockchain was Bitcoin, was blockchain one. Um, you know, Ethereum was 1.5. There's something called Ripple that was like blockchain two. Very, very specialised uh, on financial services. And then um, R3, Hashgraph, um, Hyperledger, these are like blockchain three. It's not even blockchain anymore, so that's where you have to use the, the technical term distributed ledger. But, you know, I'm still not convinced that you'll do anything like electronic voting on any of these technologies. Um, I don't think that you can do healthcare on any of these technologies as yet. So maybe um, distributed ledger technology 4 will be interesting and it will be something that we haven't seen yet. You know, if, if this was a bloody big book, um, we'd just be finishing Chapter 2. And, you know, the conclusion of Chapter 2 would be, um, this has been a very interesting and very important um, innovation. And chapter three will start to explain why um, the, the rush, the mad rush to use the original blockchain is um, is going to, I think it's going to fall in a heap. But um, what will what will continue to, to develop are these third generation, very exciting things. So R3 and Hyperledger, very exciting. Every cloud has a silver lining, and if the silver lining of the hope of the hype is that it created a lot of interest and a lot of investment in new R&D, then that's great. Um, I think that that's probably um, a very generous interpretation. I think a lot of money is being wasted on first generation misuse of this technology and, and people should have been more prudent and, and more careful. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, without a doubt, the very, the very good thing that's coming out of the original invention is that it is inspiring a lot of innovation. And, you know, like with any innovation wave, like I said about the Wright Brothers Flyer, if you look at the first generation aeroplanes, most of them were just farcical. Um, but 10, 15, 20 years after the flyer, you had a real airline industry. Um, and I think that the same thing will happen. So I'm afraid to say that we'll look back on a lot of these first generation blockchain applications as like early vintage vehicles and they'll all be, we'll, we'll have a little sympathetic chuckle about a lot of them, I think. Um, but I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, I, I just say to people, you need to be very um, um, patient and more modest about the sorts of problems that you're trying to solve. So in healthcare, yes, you need trust. Yes, you need decentralised, redundant data. Yes, you need security. But there's much more to the story than that. Um, and you, you know, you shouldn't be spending a million dollars on a blockchain database until you um, do some 
really nice requirements analysis and become a good customer. You know, a lot of a lot of healthcare people are rushing into this and they're being a bit naive as customers of this information. So I don't think there's a big boat that's going to be missed. You can put anything on the blockchain you like, but you can also do something like um, cook a, a, a roast beef on top of your engine. You know, you can wrap up a piece of meat and some foil and cook it on your engine and you get a mediocre result and you, and you can damage your engine. Um, you can do it, but it's not what the engine was ever designed for. And, you know, I'm afraid, I'm being a little bit cheeky, but I'm afraid that some of these Bitcoin applications are not much better than that. And I should repeat that I'm very optimistic about some third generation technology. It's really good because it's being done by people that are inspired um, and disciplined. Um, so you'll see fragmentation of this. You'll see a lot of special purpose digital ledger technologies that are, that are fit for different purposes. You know, I think what I'm saying is quite sober and quite sane because it's the story of every technology. It's, it, it, they all go down this pathway. And we have to remember that some really, really cool things um, just never happen. You know, look at cold fusion 20 years ago. Those, those chemists looked like they'd solved the holy grail of energy and um, something was going on, but it, that, that proved out to be a faint hope. If you're very Darwinian, you could say, look, what we've got here is like a Cambrian explosion and there's a whole lot of random mutations and some very, very strange sort of six-legged, three-armed, tentacle sort of submarine monsters are emerging and some of those things will, through, will survive and some of them will die and go extinct. And if you're really cold Darwinian, you'd say, you know, at the end of the Cambrian explosion, we wound up with them um, with stable species. So you can take that view if you like, but you know, we're not like that. We're, we're agents, um, we're conscious agents, and we should be predicting the future rather than just letting it happen. And um, yeah, I think that we need more critical thinking and um, better application of blockchain than just letting these things sort of randomly, randomly um, um, burst out all over the place. We continue to see a lot of distraction and a lot of false hope um, for blockchain and things like healthcare. Um, healthcare is a hell of a problem. Um, but, you know, things like public hospitals are the most complicated organisations on the planet. There's many, many layers and um, there's standards and there are procedures and there are, are accountability. Um, you know, one of the biggest things in healthcare is accountability. Um, if somebody gives me a diagnosis, how good is it? Can I get a second opinion? Um, where's the evidence? Um, where's the quality? Um, what happens if a, if a surgery fails? It's all about accountability. Blockchain is utterly, fundamentally, philosophically opposed to accountability. It does not even provide you the way to get your keys back. Um, it's, it's, it's anathema to blockchain, all of those things that I just mentioned. And that's fine. That's not a criticism of blockchain. Um, you know, Bitcoin's got its place in the world. I think it's a good thing that people can transmit anonymous money. Um, it's good for the unbanked. It's good for the remittance industry. But um, you can't take something that was designed for one purpose and throw it at healthcare. So I think that the hype is bad because I continue to see conferences and um, companies asking for money and, and a lot of distraction trying to um, graunch blockchain into areas where it just, it just doesn't belong. Hey, look, I'm happy to be wrong, um, and I'm a scientist, Manuel. I'm a scientist, and I, I'm used to being wrong. I'm used to making hypotheses and testing them and being wrong. So I could well be wrong. And I know that if in 20 years' time, um, banking around the world is using a new um, R3 network instead of the SWIFT network, then people could rightly say, you see, blockchain did change the world. Um, and that's a half full, that's a generous interpretation of you know, the legacy of blockchain. I'd be very happy for that. But uh, I, I, I stand up and say that blockchain in its original form is not going to do electronic voting. It's not going to change democracy. Um, it's not going to produce identity for the one billion people in the world that have no digital identity. It can't do that. It's not what it was designed for. Um, what's going to happen there is that cell phone accounts and cryptographic keys that we put in the we put in the hands of refugees via smartphones that'll change the world 
If we have a, a cheap smartphone, $20 smartphone that um, you know non-government organisations can put in the hands of refugees or disadvantaged people as they move from one place to another, and then they can use that as keys for internet banking, that'll change the world. But um, blockchain on its own doesn't do any of that stuff. So, yeah, I stand to be corrected, but I don't think that it's going to change the world in, in the way that... Um, that the futurists say. I think it's going to be a long, much more steady journey that we go down. And, and you're going to see multiple technologies inspired by this thing. It solved an unsolvable problem, and that was inspirational. But we've seen this in other cycles where <clears throat> people will all of a sudden jump out of their silo or jump out of their comfort zone. Um, and so people treat it as like a, like a blank slate, tabula rasa, to impose my own world-changing um, schemas onto blockchain. The trouble is that blockchain is no tabula rasa. It was a very, very specialised algorithm that did one thing, and it doesn't even do it very well. If you care about electricity consumption, it's the most inefficient way to buy a cup of coffee. And it has all of these externalised costs that will drive economists mad eventually. Like, who's really paying for the power? Um, so it's not magical. It did a magic thing. It, it solved e-cash without an umpire. That's magical, but it's not magic. It's a piece of applied cryptography that produces digitally signed records and it crowdsources the oversight of electronic cash. It's very, very specific. And um, no engineer should pick up a tool that was finely crafted for one particular job and pick it up and use it for anything else. Um, you've, got to, you've got to look at that marvellous new tool, set it down, Think about what it does and think about how you can you know, copy it. Um, and that's what R3 did. They said, look, there are things that blockchain does. We want to copy that um, in other very specific areas. And that, you know, I think that that's what innovation and digital transformation are all about. Um, being clear about what problem you're trying to solve and what the properties are of a good solution.